Hey, hey, hey. Impromptu Live. Um, going to let Instagram spend some time pushing it out to the feed that I am live. Um, for those of you who will be watching the replay, hello, my name is Pasa Danny. Um, I am the founder and leader of Unfit Christian, which is a digital congregation centering Black uh, faith and spirituality. So happy to see you guys joining. Um, some of you might be returning from the live that we started on the day of the social media rapture, but um, actually going to go in a totally different direction than what I started that day. So since so many of you are already joining on, um, hey, 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 love all of y'all, love to all of y'all that are joining. I am not going to dilly dally and I'm going to try not to be before you long, um, but please know that is usually a lie, especially come from somebody who is black churched. <laughs> But yo, um, really just want to kind of come on and have a real authentic conversation about my location, um, about some things that I have been wrestling with and grappling with. And honestly, I think, well, let me take that back. I'm sure I am not the only one who is navigating this space. So real quick life updates for those of you who are not subscribed to my patreon um you may not have like succinct life updates for me you have kind of seen some things that i've talked about publicly either through my stories or through the post so you might have seen my liturgy about um you know when death is not an option so I, you know i've been vocal about navigating this space of depression um and anxiety some of you are aware or have pieced together at least that i am living between two cities so currently you are probably used to seeing this background because this is my house in Atlanta. So I am currently in Atlanta right now taking care of some business. Um, but I have also been living in Maryland. So I have moved to the DMV over the summer and I have been traveling between Atlanta and Maryland um, because I'm selling my house here in Atlanta. And that has been a process. It has been a thing. Good to see you too, Sib. Um, you know, love your content, Elevated Conjure. You know you are definitely one of my favorite people that I follow. Um, you know, love, love, love to you. Thank you for the ways in which you love on me. Um, anyway, yeah, so I am currently living between cities. And so a lot of this has been, um, it's been a process. And y'all know my story. If you have been following me for a minute, you know that I left my corporate gig um, in February of this year. And that whole story, if you are not familiar with that story, it is in my Instagram um, videos. So if you go on my profile and you type a uh, tap on the IGTV icon, you can go back and watch that story as I talked about the process of leaving there. But where I am now <laughs> is that space where I have really been doing that deep introspective, deep soul level work that requires me to unpack a lot of either wounds that I wasn't aware was there, um, power that I had not tapped into, and all the things in between. So tonight, I actually want to talk about this thing I've been wrestling with, this this trust factor. I trust God, but do I trust myself? So the thing I've been wrestling with lately, as I've been navigating, you know, depression and anxiety and worry and life changes and all of these big things, is anger with God, right? So I've been I've been upset and frustrated with God because I'm like, God, you know what? I was very clear with you about what I needed, where I wanted to go, the things I wanted for my life. I set intentions. I've done the work. I have called into being so much life for so many other people, my clients, my friends, my loved ones. Like I have that power and I see the manifestation and the, the impact of my ability to call into being these things. And so God, here I am setting these intentions for myself. Here I am telling you, you know, early on, this is what I need. This is where I'm going. This is what I'm doing. God, I have done everything you have asked me to. I have said yes. Every time you have asked me to do a thing, I have showed up. And God, now here I am in a place, in a space where I said I didn't want to be and I can't see you. I, I don't see your hand in this. And I feel like we're in the space where we are in a dysfunctional relationship. 
I have conversations with God for real. So, you know, I, I can't speak for how y'all talk to God, but for me, I have conversations with God for real. When I am at a point in my prayers and, and conversations where I am yelling and I am cursing, I am screaming and I'm crying because I just want God to hear me. I remember doing this recently and I stopped in the middle of it and I said, God, this is dysfunctional. I don't even talk to your people like this. I don't even argue with people here on earth with me. You know, I don't argue like that because I don't like to be in this space. I don't like to be in this position. And so, God, I can't be in this dysfunctional relationship with you. But where are you? Where have you shown up in this? Why is it that I can do and be all of this for other people? Why is it that I can literally conjure into being the lifestyle that other people desire, um, that they spoke to me? Why is it that I can call down their folks? I can call down this thing, that thing, and I can't do it for myself. And finally, it hit me this past week that what if the issue is not trusting God? What if the issue is trusting myself? And I think like so many other believers, either past or present, no matter what your current practice is faith-wise, I think so many of us have, we trust God more than we give ourselves credit for, but I don't think we trust ourselves in the way that we trust this external idea of God, this idea that God can move around us and about us, but not necessarily trusting the God within us, right? And so I had to ask myself, like, how do I know that I trust God? And for me, it came down to the fact that despite how bad things get, no matter how much I'm I'm angry, no matter how frustrated I am, no matter how much I begin to contemplate not wanting to be here, okay? Because I didn't just write that liturgy from just some idealized place. I literally was in that space of not wanting to be here, but recognizing that that was not an option for me, right? And so no matter how bad things get, no matter how things seem to not be clearing up or coming to pass or all of these things, there is still a deep part of me that believes that God will not allow me, truly allow me to fail without rescue or truly allow me to just completely fall apart without at least a plan to either put me back together or to save me. And to some degree, I had to unpack, is that religious baggage, right? Is that just my conditioning of you know, how we, we have been taught, and I say we, those of us who are raised in the church um, or have participated at some point deeply in church, this idea that, like, he may not come when you want him, but he'll be there right on time or, like, he'll never leave you nor forsake you. There is a lot of conditioning that happens um, within the practice of, of westernized Christian, Christianity that tells us these ideas around, like, God will never leave you. And so when I have this hope, even in my deepest pit of despair, I had to ask myself, is this truly just me going through religious conditioning or is this truly what I believe? And I have experienced enough to this point to know that for me, that is literally just the way my belief system is set up. It is the way that I, I have experienced God enough in my life to know that God will not leave me nor forsake me. So if I have this, this deep trust in God, that even when depression robs me of my memories of things that are good, when depression and anxiety robs me of my ability to, to recall and recount the ways in which I have overcome, the ways in which I have, you know, been successful in all of the things that we, we label as, as productivity and success and um, accomplishment, if I can still hold on to that, to those to that belief and that trust in God that she will not leave me, then I have to ask myself, where is the trust lacking? And is it sufficient to trust in God alone? And I have to be honest with you and say, I don't believe the answer is yes. I don't think it's enough to just trust in God if you cannot trust in yourself. Um, we, we trust in an idea in this external concept of God, um, but not necessarily. The Bible says that we are made in the reflection of the image of God, which means that we have divinity within us. And so it's one thing to trust this external idea of God, this, this, pace, this place in space where it's like, you know, 
God will work around me. You know, God will come in and rescue. God will come in and bring a thing and God will come in and make a miracle. But sometimes that voice inside of us is telling us the next instruction and the next step and is the answer to the prayers when we've been asking for clarity and for guidance. But when we don't trust ourselves, it's not simply enough to trust God because, yes, I trust God, but I don't trust myself enough to trust that that voice is going to lead me to where it is that I have been praying and asking God to take me. Why? Because I don't trust myself because that lack of trust is built out of a scarcity wound. So if you've watched my stories today, you watch me share a post talking not about scarcity mindset, reframing it as a scarcity wound when you are someone who has experienced lack of be it, you know, care, be it love, be it finances, be it stability, be it whatever you have experienced lack in. The way our brains are wired, we are wired for survival. That is literally a product of evolution. As we have evolved over, you know, millennia and millions of years and experiences as as human beings, we have put ourselves in this place where our brains are like, how do we survive? How do we stay alive? And so when you are living and leaning into a scarcity wound, we are we have so many people around us who are keep telling us it's a scarcity mindset. You need to get out of your scarcity mindset and you need to live and align with abundance and all that shit sounds good. But in practice, your mind is quite literally wired to survive. And so it has learned its lesson from the past experiences where you were lacking to be in a place where it's constantly saying, how can I avoid that experience again? So for me, you know, I can't talk about y'all, so I'll talk about myself. For me, my scarcity wound is finances, right? I grew up in the working poor. I grew up working class. Um, I have experienced... uh, transitional homelessness. I have experienced, you know, being put out in evictions and, you know, car repossessions and, you know, bills and bill. Like I've experienced that. And so and it's not just some like little short term. I did it for six months. I grew up in a lifestyle of that way. Right. My mother was hardworking. She's working 40, 60 hours a week, but the job is not paying a living wage. Now, mind you, this is the 90s, right? Because I'm 33. So this is the 90s. Right. And so if I'm not paying a living wage, then, you know, sure as hell ain't paying one now right and so I find myself in this place as an adult constantly fighting and trying to survive so that I never land in that place again and so the moment anything comes up that looks like I might be in that place again it puts me in this space of I've got to survive my scarcity wound pops up. And so because it is such a deep wound and I have done my work in terms of going to therapy and I've tried, you know, mindset techniques and, you know, talking to myself and using affirmations and uprooting these these subconscious narratives, it does not change the fact that my brain is quite literally wired for survival just like yours is. And so my need to survive also means that I can't trust things that I have not experienced to know that they work. So what am I saying here? When you are in this space of you trust God and you're clear on your trust in God, but you don't necessarily trust yourself, you find yourself in in that space where you do begin to get these downloads and your divinity is speaking up and saying, this is your next step, this is the thing to do, try this, try that. Your survival instincts kick in because that scarcity wound is now cracked open and you're like, oh no, oh no, I can't do that thing because I don't know how it's going to turn out. What I can do is what I know has helped me survive. What I can do, even, you know, I think I've talked about this public, I know I have, when I talked about fear being a home, right? It's like, you know you're not supposed to be afraid and you know, you know, you're supposed to go into things with, you know, courage and all of and faith and hope and all of those things. But scarcity will put you in fear and fear, even though it may not be the thing that helps you, it is a thing that, you know, and so you find yourself cleaving to it. You find yourself holding on to it because it is what, you know, even though it's in complete misalignment of who it is that you want to become. So when I talk about this, this, this phenomenon of trusting God, but not necessarily trusting yourself, you have to have both, right? You have to be in a space where you trust yourself enough to trust the voice 
of of instruction, of clarity, of divinity coming to you and telling you to do a thing. But a lot of us find ourselves in that space where we just can't get over the hump. We just can't dig deep and push on and do further like we are instructed to do. I talked to my mom about this the other day and she made a poignant statement. She said, so often we tell ourselves and we tell each other, you know, get up, dust yourself off, try again. And so many of us have lived by that motto. Life hits us and we go, okay, life has hit us. It is what it is. I'm going to get up. I'm going to try again. I'm going to get up and I'm going to do again. But my mom said what we forget to do quantify and what we often forget to address is the amount of fear the amount of pain the amount of trauma that we accumulate every time we fall and how hard it is to get back up that next time and so we find ourselves hitting that wall where those things that we have tried those methods we have tried of what it takes to get up dust yourself off and keep going those methods aren't working anymore and it's not enough trust in god in the world to overcome a lack of trust in yourself because to trust in god means you also have to trust yourself because you are a reflection of god and so a lot of times we hear instructions and we hear clarity and because it is unfamiliar because it is something for which we do not have in our minds evidence for working, we run away from it and we find ourselves in this place of going, no, that can't be, it. I can't do that. And so we go back to our familiar methodology. And that survival wiring, because that's what it is when we go back to this familiar methodology, it's survival wiring that causes a rewire of our instincts. Because our instinct should be that we do trust ourselves because nobody knows us better than us, right? We should trust our own story. We should trust our own voice. We should trust our divinity. I always say, and this is kind of a side note, but it's going to fit in here. I always say that when you receive a prophecy, when you receive a divination, when you receive somebody who is tapped into a spiritual source to give you a message about your life, I always personally, and there are going to be people who disagree with me, but I personally feel it should be a confirmation of something that was already in your spirit. It should be something that you were already kind of aware of, but it brings affirmation to that questioning that you had going on, right? And so... When you find yourself in this place where your survival is so hardwired that you can't trust your, let's not call it instinct, you can't trust your intuition anymore, that is the core part of yourself. And so, yeah, trusting God to be this external fixer around you can paralyze you from hearing the voice of God, the intuition, the clarity that you need in order to move forward within you. I hope I'm making sense. For those of you who are just joining me, I'm going to reset the room real quick. First of all, welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to have you. Uh, tonight, I'm talking about uh, trusting God, but not necessarily trusting yourself and my own journey with wrestling with this particular idea and, and how I am finding myself in this place of healing and doing my own internal work of deconstructing. So here's the thing. Um... Like I said, we're going to be before y'all long. So all of that said, I have been kind of dealing with this in myself. And once I have realized that that is the location that I'm in, the first thing I have to do is give myself grace. Because I didn't know what I didn't know until I knew it, right? And so my default could be into going to blaming myself and saying, okay, this is my fault. And if I had only figured this out earlier, I wouldn't be in this location, right? That is the tendency. Again, that's a, that's a scarcity thing. That's a survival thing. Because all your brain is wired to do is say, how do I survive? How do I get out of this uncomfortable situation? How do I get to where it is that I desire to be? And if you're someone like me, sometimes that comes through as... Um, there's being introspective and then there is always constantly questioning yourself as if there was something more that you could do, right? So the first thing I had to do when I recognized this was say, give yourself grace, Danielle. This happens. You you learned it at the time that you were ready to receive it. You learned it at the time where you were really, truly, fully ready to acknowledge it and be open to it. Because I can't be honest to say to you, if I had known this earlier or if I had heard this earlier that 
I would have been open to receiving it, right? It came at the time that I needed to hear it. And once again, I'm not in a destitute place. I ain't where I want to be. And things have not aligned in the way that I would want them to align. But I'm not in a, I'm not in that place, right? Again, this reaffirms or reinvigorates my trust in God. But now I recognize that I have to trust in myself. So how am I doing this work to unpack in real time? I'm confronting my anxious imagination, okay? So a lot of this, again, that survival produces these anxious thoughts around um, whose fault it is, what you can do better, how can you fix it? Like, if you're like me, you go into immediate fixing mode, right? Exactly, Stephanie Pollard. Like, this really jumps up when you are running a business, and that's part of the thing, too, is like, um, as somebody who is, you know, running a business and self-employed is running a brand. And and more than that, I'm not just running a brand. I'm running ministry, right? So I'm not just responsible for myself. I'm also responsible for those who, who accept my leadership as their digital pastor, right? Who even just follow, you know, my work casually across social media. I feel responsible for what I am putting out into the world. Um, at the same time, I'm also navigating who I am, where I am, and what I am doing, right? So back to confronting these anxious imaginations. So again, that survival thing, going into the space of what can I do, what can I do better? Um, some of my anxious imaginations imagines the worst, right? And so in order to confront that, I use writing as a tool. So I um, started keeping a journal a couple months ago. It was always a goal of mine to like be consistent in writing a journal. And, um, you know, I've gotten into that practice as a devotion. And the one thing I did, and this is before I went live talking to y'all, the one thing I did was write down all the worst things I thought could happen. Because let me be honest with you, the instruction I kept hearing from God when I kept, or the instruction I kept hearing within myself that I wasn't acknowledging as the God body within me, but was just kind of going, that's just some random thought that I can't trust right now. The instruction I heard was, let the word do the work. That meant that I had to get more visible. I had to have more conversations like these. I had to um, stop hiding in certain ways and, and showing up in my content. It meant that I had to do things without going through these mental rehearsals of how polished it should look and it needs to be produced in this way. It needs to be done that way and I need to think it through and all of these things that really gave me excuses not to do it, right? The instruction I heard was let the work do the work and my immediate response to God was like, I can't do that. I can't do that. You know why I can't do that? Here's all the reasons. Here are all the things that can go terribly wrong. Um, You know, I could be rambling and nobody pays attention and thinks what I say matters. I can turn into a meme on the internet. I can, you know, lose such and such and, you know, say something wrong and lose all these, you know, people who are part of my community. Like, I thought of all the worst things. Okay, I'm just going to be honest. Um, and I had to write those things down because that allowed me to confront my anxious thoughts. Um, at the same time, the process of getting it out of my head onto paper allowed me to see just how ridiculous some of those thoughts were. I'm just being honest. It allowed me to really engage myself in a way that keeping it in my head and just rolling it around in my head, which is really a safe space because I don't have to confront it. I could just keep all the thoughts there. I don't have to really look at it and tangibly see what it is that I have been putting myself through, right? The narratives and the torture I have been putting myself through. When I put it down on paper, it makes me confront it, right? And so I'm going through and seeing it allows me to say, here are the ways in which that's not possible. Here are the ways in which that doesn't have to happen. And so I also began to write down the possible outcomes of just trying, right? Because it put me in this place of like, I don't know, again, that that instruction I got was so unfamiliar from how I am accustomed to um, showing up and surviving, right? How I'm accustomed to what I can trust to show up and survive, right? And so when I'm able to sit there and see it on paper and then say, you know what, child, this ain't, this ain't what you think it is. Like literally you can get on the internet and you say a thing and it's just an entire conversation. You're lying to yourself. I had to get real with me, right? Like 
Literally, girl, you have sat here and wrote a post and it ends up being picked up by news media and like you was just writing, you was just talking or you'll get up and write a post and next thing you know, you getting thousands of thousands of likes all because you t decide to take something out of your head and put it on paper because you decide to speak up. Girl, you are bullshitting yourself saying that you don't have the power to show up in this way or that you would be, you know, somehow lost if you were to do this in a way that you were not comfortable with doing, right? So I had to be honest and get real with myself. I had to call myself out on the lies that I've been telling myself because those lies protected my scarcity wound. Let me repeat that. Those lies protected my scarcity wound. And protecting my scarcity wound is part of surviving. That's the fucked up part, <laughs> right? It goes in this, it's, it's like this, this terrible cycle, but it's true, right? That behavior protects my scarcity wound and my survival instinct says we have to protect this fool because it is impossible to tell ourselves a new story. It is impossible for life to show us a new story. And that is out of integrity with knowing who God is and has been to me. And more importantly, of knowing my divinity within myself and the way in which I have called things into being that came out of nowhere. Right. So I know that life can tell me a new story. I know that, you know, these things can happen. But when I am in survival mode, when everything is going wrong, my mind's ideas, we've got to protect our scarcity wound by. By feeding it what it needs to feel like this thing is not happening. These are lies and illusions, but it literally made me feel like things were okay. And so the second thing I have been doing is working with myself instead of against myself. There is a specific blueprint for who I am and how I show up in the world. If you followed me for a minute, you know, you've seen me talk about human design. Um, and so human design is... It's different than astrology, but the easiest way is to kind of line it up is to astrology is it uses your, you know, time and place of birth um, to map out what your personality and, you know, your your wiring looks like. Right. Um, and so I happen to be there are four, sorry, five different types of human designs um, base level. And I happen to be a manifester. And so. One thing I have been doing is fighting against the natural design of who I am. Part of protecting that scarcity wound um, is I want to wait and see somebody else execute this idea because then I can have proof that it works. Like I am looking for proof that something works when as a manifester, it is my job to just put something out there and to do it first. Right. And so. With me working against myself, waiting for somebody to lead the way, waiting for somebody else to do it first, flies in the face of who I am and the truth that I have known. When I have spoken on things or put out my particular theological framework of something, my hermeneutic of something, the way in which I see the text and re-envision the text and decentering, you know, white supremacy within the faith and decentering the need for Christianity as the only and sole way um, in which to find divinity. When I have done these things, when nobody else was doing it, it has rewarded me um, in terms of people seeing me as an expert, but also um, shifting and challenging the narrative. So literally, I can't wait for somebody else to engage the thing um, when I have to do it first. Exactly that, Bill. It's like when you get proof and then I can't do it because somebody else will say that I'm following them instead of me being the person who led it. Yes, right? And it's just like, that makes no sense. But that's exactly how you end up feeling, right? And so part of this uh, coming out of this space of, or coming into a space rather of trusting myself means that I have to recognize what I have already done and the proof that has been the pudding. If I can trust the voice of God and the ancestors and spirit guides and all that is divine and holy to speak to me, to speak into the lives of other people and to call into being the things um that they desire or that I just even hear for them. Um, if I can trust, and I am 100% confident, if I've ever given you a reading, I know what I'm doing, right? If I've ever done a divination for you, I know what I'm doing. Even if I've talked to you casually and started calling down things that I've heard for you, I trust myself in that space. So why 
Am I giving more of my divinity to other people than I give to myself? Let me repeat that. Why are we giving more of our divinity to others than we give to ourselves? Why are we giving that gift away and not giving it to ourselves? There lies the issue with us trusting ourselves. And so I have to come to this place and space of recognizing that I am worthy of the divinity that I pour out into the world. I am worthy of being the first partaker of that divinity and allowing that voice within me that speaks clearly, even though it's soft, it's not forceful, it's not like, you go do this, it's going to be that. Like, that's usually my anxiety and scarcity when I'm talking. But like that, that clear uh, instruction of clarity that continues to repeat itself assertively, but not aggressively, right? I have to learn to trust that and learn that I am worthy of that because the root of me not trusting myself is not just the scarcity wound, but the fact that the scarcity wound convinced me that I am unworthy of a new narrative, that I am unworthy of a new story, that I am unworthy of moving forward and being free and being really completely healed from this space that tells me I, I am not worthy of that, right? So I find myself in this place, like even just having this conversation with y'all, um, I literally had to say, if you look before you leap, you will find every reason not to leap, right? Like we tell people the advice of look before you leap and sometimes that shit works, but sometimes you just gotta, you just gotta leap. Like I, I've said this before and I'll say it again. Like when you take a long jump from a height, um, like if you're bungee jumping or if you zip lining or whatever, um, or you're climbing a tree, you're climbing some height. The first thing they tell you is not to look down, right? Because if you don't, if you look down, you're going to find every reason to never jump, to never leap, to do everything. Because your first instinct is going to be, how do I survive this? There is no way I can survive this. If I fall, something should happen. I'm going to die, right? Um, and so they tell you to look up. They tell you to continue to keep your focus and your prize on where you're going. And so the same thing happens when we get these instructions that seem to be going so against our scarcity wound narratives and it, they're supposed to go against our scarcity wound narrative because the instructions we are getting the clarity that we're getting is meant to heal us it and i'm not saying that it's going to be a one-time one-shot thing and healing is just instantaneous and everything's wonderful but you have to Anybody who's worked in medical care or has, you know, um, taken care of a sick loved one who had to have wound care, like wound care takes time, right? You have to do it over time to continue to make treatments, but you have to at least start to get to the point of finding a healing for that wound. And so when we get these voices of clarity that go against all of our narratives that scarcity wound has taught us, it is because it's supposed to. It's supposed to agitate that wound so we can begin to heal it, right? And so even in me, in this space, me having this conversation with y'all is me leaping and not looking, right? Not editing myself while I'm having this conversation, not going, you know, I need to write the script out. I need to have this. I need to have that. It's literally trusting myself and trusting the voice within me and trusting that I'm being brought to this point for a reason, right? Because it is time for me to leap from this particular stage of wound healing into a new one, right? And so, um, literally, for me, again, back to my human design as a manifester, I passiveness and waiting on somebody else to do it first will never bring me the opportunities I'm looking for. It'll never bring me to where it is that I desire to be. It will never move me further. In fact, if I continue to try to stay in place and and wait on somebody else to do it first and try to force all this bigness that I am, all this great gift that I have, all the ways in which I have shown up in this world as a voice, as a force, if I keep trying to force that into the small spaces of fear and anxiety, I am going to find myself stagnant. I am going to find myself in this place. Absolutely, HR educator. Most of us are not taught how to leap. We are taught how to survive. A lot of us are raised. I hate that quote. Like It's like, were you raised in love and survival? Bitch, I was raised in both. <laughs> like, I was raised in both. Like, 
literally I, I had I come from a family who loves me and they love the hell out of me but they are also deeply cemented to you that love looks like I'm going to teach you how to survive this world it looks like I don't have an experience that can show you that there is something beyond what I know, but I'm going to teach you what it means to navigate and survive this world as a black woman, as a black person, as a fat body person, as a dark skin person, um, insert other archetype, insert other marginalized, marginalized, excuse me, marginalized identity here. We're going to say that word tonight. Insert other marginalized identity here. Like, they are teaching me what they know because they love me, right? Um, it wasn't just I'm surviving. It's I love you and I want you to survive this world that is harsh to you. So many of us are not taught how to leave. When I made the decision to quit my job, yeah, my mom supported me. But that was after years of my mom doing her own work. I promise you, if that was my mama from five years ago, she said, don't quit that damn job. That's your job, right? You worked so hard to get here, but like... I was unhappy and I was miserable. And a lot of us just say, tuck it in and bear it. Keep going because you need that job and that's going to be your source and that's what's going to supply you. So we're not taught to leap. We are taught to take carefully calculated steps for survival. And so when things come in that agitate that, that shake that up, we find ourselves in places where we are looking at every reason not to leap. And so we find ourselves standing there and then still complaining that we haven't arrived at the point we want to. You can't get to where you're going if you don't move your feet. But we trust what we can see and we trust what we know. And a lot of times what we know and what we have been wired is in such opposition of what, it, what we need in order to grow and to move forward. So I'm somebody who also cannot go by fixed strategies. So like all of these, you know, if you do this and you go live this number of times and you post this kind of story and you curate this kind of thing, that ain't me. That ain't me. That ain't me. I like to speak when I have something to say. I like to have these conversations when I, hmm, <laughs> not only am I processing in real time, but when I can give you a hope to turn a corner. I don't believe in selling the illusion of solution, right? I talked about this on my private, you know, on my personal Facebook page. I should say yesterday, it's not private. It's all my posts at public. Um, but on my personal profile, I talked about this, you know, problem in the industry where we sell the illusion of solution, where we sell lifestyles and we don't tell people about the hard work. Like y'all are listening to me talk in real time about the hard work of unpacking my own bullshit. And a lot of y'all can relate because you're in that same place, right? And so I have to be spirit led. I have to do things that I feel like are are going to change people's lives, even if the work is hard, even if the work makes you cry, even if it leaves you feeling depleted because you have to empty out all that shit that doesn't serve you where you're going. I believe in showing up in that way. And so a lot of times it means I show up differently than my peers. A lot of times it means that like, I ain't on every panel. I'm not on every cool, you know, cool person's uh, stage and, you know, conferences and all that shit. And I have to be okay with it. I can't start. I can't. Part of the thing is I compare myself to that. I'm going to tell y'all the truth. I compare myself to that and I go, well, why am I not there? I'm just as good. I'm just as that. And so then it starts to feed into that survival instinct. It starts to feed into that scarcity wound and it starts to tell me that there must be something infinitely wrong with me if I'm not being included in those places. But that desire to be included goes against who I am and how I am built as a person because I am more than sufficient enough to come and use my own platform and have these conversations. I have never posted an ad, a sponsored post, or anything. Everything I have built for Unfit Christian has been by my own sweat, blood, and tears. That's not to say people have not helped me. It's not to say that people have not supported me and shouted me out. That's not what I mean when I say that. What I am saying is that like, I have built this in earnest because I wanted to build it in integrity. And so part of this means that like dealing with my scarcity wound means I have to stop comparing or using other people rather as a litmus for who I am. Am I showing up in a way that is authentic to me? 
And am I listening to the voice of God, the voice of clarity, the voice of my ancestors, the voice of spirit God within me to show up in the way that I'm supposed to? And if I'm not, then the flaw is with me. The flaw is with my ability to trust myself. And the reason I'm not doing that is because I don't trust myself. So how do I unpack that? It all comes back to I can trust God externally to do a thing and intervene for me, but that's such a waste of my divinity. That's such a waste of what God has already given me in terms of tools to to check in with myself and to hear clearly and to know a thing and to at least try. What harm comes from trying, right? So another thing I have to do is to release trust surrogates. So what is a trust surrogate? For me, a trust surrogate is looking to others for permission and approval to show up as who I know I am. Because the more I put my trust in trust surrogates, the less trust I put in myself. The more I look for other people to give me permission by either showing up and doing it for, you know, first so I can look at it and say whether it works or by allowing people or allowing myself to need the approval of others. Galatians 1 and 10 says, am I now seeking the approval of men? If I were seeking the approval of men, I would not be a servant of Christ, right? So if, if I can't trust myself enough to do the thing, knowing who I am when I lay down at night, knowing all of me, everything that has happened in my life to this point, everything I desire in my heart, I know me better than anybody else on this planet. I know the secret prayers that I have prayed to God. I know the tears that I have cried in my closet. I know what I have asked and what I petitioned God for, things I ain't even told my best friend, my mama, people who are closest to me. I know who I am, and yet I am looking and seeking approval and permission from people who don't know a tenth of who I am or who God has called me to be. Trust surrogates, because it's so much easier for me to say, well, okay, well, they approved of it. And they said I could do it, or they gave me permission in some kind of way and said I can do it. And now I can do it. At some point, those folks ain't going to be there for a couple reasons. One, because just seasons change and the people that you're looking to for approval today may not be in your life tomorrow. Secondly, because at some point you're going to continue to do things based on their approval. And eventually you're going to outdo them and you're going to outperform them and their humanity is going to kick in and their jealousy is going to kick in and all this shit is going to kick in and suddenly they're going to go from supporting you and approving you and supporting you. And the next thing you know, they tell you not to do a certain thing and they tell you not to show up a certain way, not because it's not what you need to do, but because if you continue to do it in that way, you're going to continue to outpace them and they don't want that. So people you're looking for, for permission and approval turn out to be the people who become your downfall. Trust surrogates. I have to release trust surrogates. I literally cannot thrive when I look to other people for permission and approval. Now, as a a manifest of human design type, I can inform them of the thing I'm going to do. And I do that often. Like, I'll talk to, you know, my inner circle. I got an inner sanctum of folks that I talk to. And then there's another, you know, set of folks just outside them that I talk to and run ideas by. And, like, I get their feedback from a perspective of how should I, you know, maybe show up in this way, but not can I show up in this way? Not should I show up in this way? It is more so like it's it's checks and balances as opposed to permission and approval, right? And so I have to get in this space of of not needing trust surrogates and trusting myself and knowing who I am and how I show up is enough. Because the reality is nobody doubts you more than you. Even your biggest hater does not doubt you more than you. Nobody doubts you more than you. You'll be sitting here thinking, well, I really ain't got that much offer. It ain't that big of a deal. Well, nobody's going to really want that. And it can't be that special. There are so many times I have written and put stuff into the world. And I'll be like, well, shit, I'm surprised that took off. I didn't think it was that big of a deal. But it ended up being the thing that somebody needed to get to their next place. It ended up being something that was significant. And if I continue to talk myself out of and I continue to tell myself that I am not worthy of these things, eventually I'm going to believe that narrative. And that shit supports my scarcity one which I'm supposed to be healing and getting out of right and so when you find yourself in this place of of using these trust surrogates what you end up having to realize is that you can't please everybody 
that's the key is that because you don't trust yourself the most because you you doubt yourself the most you spend so much time seeking approval and seeking permission by being people pleasing and you're trying to say i'm so i'm talking about me so i can't talk about you what happens is you'll go i can't put this product out there because if i do then somebody's gonna think that Oh, I'm just money hungry now. And that's the problem with all these spiritual workers and people who are related to the church. And she ain't no different than the rest of them. And she a fraud and she a this and she a that. Or if I um, put something out there too low, well, it must not be worth that much because she ain't charging that much for it. So it can't be worth that much. Or if I put a coaching program out there, oh, she won't charge that much. Well, how she qualified to do that? At the end of the day, here's what's true. One, you cannot please all the people all the time, and you might as well not even try. But two, what's really more true than that is that nobody will value what they don't want to fucking value. It don't matter how good you are. It don't matter how wonderful, how many um, receipts you got, how much you can point and tell people, listen, this is the way in which I've shown up and here are the results and here are the impact. If people don't value you and they don't value what you are putting out into the world, they're not going to value it at all. It don't matter if you put it out there for $10 and it's worth $10,000. they gonna still be like, it ain't that. And you know how I've learned that. You know how I've really learned that. This process of selling my house. <laughs> This process of selling my house. I literally, when you sell a home, and so some of you may not be familiar, but some of you might. When you sell a home, you go through the process of sitting down with your realtor and you look at the comps. You look at the comparisons in the market. You're looking for houses that are close in size to yours, um, very close in location, no more than five miles away. And um, all the things that you can get, get apples for apples and comparators. I priced my home at the price the market said I could price the home, right? And there have been people who have come through here and been like, well, I think for the area, it's not priced well. And it's like, well, if you look at the comps, it's literally priced to the area, right? The fact of the matter is they didn't value the home and that's okay. It doesn't change the value of the home. It doesn't change the price. It doesn't change the comps. It doesn't change the facts or the figures. But if they don't want to value the home, if they don't want to value what you are, they don't want to value your product, your service, your anointing, your greatness, your genius, they're not going to value it. And so why are you wasting your time using them as trust surrogates, looking for their permission and their approval? Why are you wasting your time beating yourself up with external narratives of devaluation of who you are, feeding into that, that scarcity wound and feeding into that miswired survival instinct that is keeping you from being where it is that you want to be? That's part of trusting yourself. That's part of trusting yourself is trusting that who you are is enough. Every time I begin to think about like going live or making video content or whatever, whatever, I have to go through this process of telling myself who you are is enough. The way in which you have shown up is enough. What you have inside of you is enough. I have spent so much time disqualifying myself literally disqualifying myself and thank you to all of you who have purchased badges so so deeply appreciative um is in the pinned comment if you'd like to support other ways um feel free to check out those resources to um support this work but nonetheless i have spent so much time telling myself disqualifying myself in opposition of the evidence i literally have been telling myself and again i'm gonna tell y'all the truth because i don't i don't have a reason to lie my best friend and my mama are both watching and they can tell you i have told them i don't feel qualified to be a coach even though that's what i've already been doing even though that's the work that i have done and i show up and i help people and i help transform and decolonize their faith and i show up and help them transform their lives in a way that aligns with what they desire i have still told myself i am not qualified and i have named every reason why i'm not and i have named every reason why i'm not worthy of what it is that i desire that's a scarcity wound it has told me i am not enough nobody is a better hater of me than me <laughs> And nobody's a better hater of you than you. And a lot of times that shit comes from a wound because we haven't been taught how to leap. Because the love that we received from our families taught us how to survive and how to navigate survival and not how to thrive. A lot of us just don't know how to thrive. We have these big lofty ideas that thriving looks like having this level of income, this kind of house, this kind of car, 
this kind of material possession um, and maybe some joy and peace and happiness will come from having acquired those things. But a lot of us don't know how to thrive because we don't know how to be at peace with ourselves. And we don't know how to be at peace with ourselves because we're at war of trying to survive. And so when you find yourself in this place of wondering what God is doing wrong, and let me be clear, it is quite fine to say, God, I don't know what the hell you're doing. I feel like you're doing something wrong, right? I told y'all in the beginning, those of you who were here, I was sharing how like I told God that I felt like our relationship was dysfunctional because I'm sitting here screaming, yelling, and crying, trying to get you to hear me. Um, and I don't even do that with people here on earth. So why gotta do that with you, right? And so being in the space of feeling like, what is God doing wrong? Why is God, I felt like God betrayed me. Oh yeah, let's, let's be real, let's keep it a buck. I felt like God betrayed me. And so being able to say, God, I feel like you have betrayed me. I feel like you have left me. I feel like you are not showing up in the ways that I have. Ask yourself and begin to contemplate, is the issue in trouble with trusting God? Because if you didn't trust God, you wouldn't be praying. If you didn't trust God to show up, if you didn't think that God could or would show up for you in some way, you wouldn't even bother having a conversation with him, her, it, they, whatever you pronoun God, right? If you didn't believe your ancestors, let's let's remove Christianity from it. If you didn't believe your ancestors, although I do think ancestral veneration is inherently Christian or at least inherently part of Christian faith, but that's a whole other conversation. Um, <laughs> your ancestors, your spirit guides, all that is divine and holy. If you didn't believe they would show up, you, would, you wouldn't show up. You wouldn't show up for the conversation. You wouldn't show up for the confrontation. And so you therefore do have a trust. So don't allow... The residue of your baptism and evangelical theology that tells you that if you are questioning, you are therefore mistrustful. No, you clearly trust God because you continue to show up for answers. But ask yourself, do you trust you? And what is triggering and what is producing this lack and inability to trust yourself? And I promise you at the bottom of it is a scarcity wound. And that's okay. I want you to be okay with that. Don't beat yourself up being in that place. So many of us have survived things that we should not have survived. So many of us have navigated places that would have broken others and we are here surviving. We have gotten up and we have brushed ourselves off and we have tried again. And yet now we are in a season where we have to deal with the residue and the remnant of all that we have accumulated every time we have gotten up, all that pain, that hurt, and that trauma and what those experiences taught us about what may not be in our possession, right? How it taught us to survive, okay? So I, be okay with that. Spend some time unpacking it. If you have a therapist, talk to your therapist about these scarcity wounds, about what they are rooted in and how you can begin to tell yourself another story. But more importantly, Trust that voice in you that agitates that scarcity wound because it is here to do wound healing. It is here to do wound care and to begin to get you a new space and place that will lead you to where it is that you want to be aligned to. Okay? So, thank y'all. Thank y'all for joining me for this impromptu live. Um, it was so good to be in community with y'all. This was freeing for me. Um, to have this conversation with y'all and to be in this space where it ain't all polished, it ain't all good. You know, I ain't got nothing but some lipstick. I ain't even got on my titty cup holder, okay? <laughs> so y'all know this was just like, you know what, let me throw on some lip and like, come on. So I appreciate y'all for sticking with me and hanging with me. Thank you for supporting. Thank you for purchasing badges. Thank you for just what you do and how you support me. Um, thank you for sharing my work. Thank you for commenting. Thank you for everything, all the engagements. Um, thank you for following me. Um, I will go live again. I'm going to save this live so the replay will be available. I'm also going to download it and put it on YouTube so I'll cross post it um, to other platforms. But yes, it will be saved for replay. Um, I'm going to go live again next week. Um, Next week on the 13th marks three years of singleness for me. So I want to talk about that journey of healing from my last relationship and um, how I'm finally at a place where I'm ready to open up and, and receive love and move into that space. So I'll be back live next week to talk about that. But in the meantime, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I love all of you. Again, this replay will be available. So if you missed part of it, go back to the beginning and watch. Um... Belle, Darcel, am I still doing Bible study? I'm going to go back to reincorporating um, 
trap Bible study on Tuesdays. I'm trying to get this house sold. Um, and that has just taken up so much of my time and so much of my energy. But I am going to go back to doing a uh, trap Bible study. And because uh, I already have some topics and stuff lined up, I just <laughs> haven't done it. So, yes, I will be going back to doing that. Um, so, yes, catch me next week for live. Um, if you are just joining, you can go back and watch the replay once it is um finalize and post it to Instagram um, on my feed and I will talk to you guys next week. Love y'all so, so much. Take care.